Hello and welcome to this CPD webcast. Uh, my name is Aidan O'Flaherty, I'm with the Engineers Ireland Continuing Professional Development Team and today I'm delighted to welcome Ben Cranks who's the Technical Consultant with HP Inc uh, to deliver a presentation entitled BIM and what it means for IT. So please Ben. Thank you very much, Aidan. I appreciate the, the chance to talk with the team at uh, Engineers Ireland here today, and hopefully my, spe my speech will be of use to you. Um, I'd really encourage everyone to, af after the speech, to be happily engage, ask questions, or send questions on to Engineers Ireland, and I can address them afterwards. I, today, my topic is going to be BIM and what it means for IT. I'm going to be addressing a bit about what BIM is, the impact it has on the organizations, and what we're doing specifically to improve performance of these devices, and what it means in terms of your equipment purchasing today. So just covering the why of BIM, the mandates, where we can get some documentation, implementation details, what it means for teams, what it means in terms of the individual devices you're, you're going for, and especially for BIM, and then some discussion of what it means around mobility, because particularly for mobility, BIM has driven radical changes. So first of why are we doing BIM? I've always joked that BIM is the realization of the Die Hard movies. In the Die Hard movie, there's a lovely 3D illustration of the building, and they can see where John McClane is up and down. We haven't been able to do that, but customers want to be able to do that. One of the key reasons is it enhances cooperation amongst the multiple disciplines that go into producing modern buildings. It ensures that the guys putting in ducting isn't getting in the way the guys putting in the central heating system. It means that as we go forward in time, that everything that is supposed to be designed it can be pointed out. So if I say I need fire doors rated to 30 minutes, I can click on the specification fire doors rated to 30 minutes, and within my 3D diagram, it will show me all the fire doors that are rated to 30 minutes. It's that kind of one-to-one -one matching between specifications and building that BIM allows us to do. It's particularly useful for smart buildings, this idea that we're going to be putting an awful lot of digital connected sensors in place. If we don't have a BIM model in a lot of ways, it's difficult for a lot of those sensors to gather the information they need and to become truly useful. If we're working off old paper, old plans that may or may not perfectly match the building anymore, we don't get that best value. Another key factor is, particularly with a lot of the the buy and run pro projects that we're seeing now, especially around the public-private partnerships, those type of deals, the building is built and then run by the prime contracting group or their maintenance arm for 20 plus years. As such, they need to ha be able to ensure that the next member staff who comes on can access everything in the building, that we're not relying on institutional knowledge of what's changing and what needs to be fixed. So that if I receive an alert that there's a leak in a, in a school down in Warwickshire, I can look in the BIM model for the school, realize I need a 30 mil pipe, I need these fixtures, and I can send those exact parts and they will be correct for the job. It's that smoothness in long-term maintenance that BIM in particular enables. So while I was doing up these slides, I was educating myself on the finer details of BIM as much as I was trying to pull in the technical details. So I thought I'd bring up some of the useful, useful tips and tricks I found. Uh, the National BIM Task Group is the UK's government's official BIM implementation body. They have a great deal of information on their website and access to a lot of resources. Um, personally, I found the AEC UK Cabin BIM Standards. Um, it's an open group. Um, but they have a really nice document that goes through best practice BIM implementation within an organization within a project. It's nicely, thickly detailed, so it's a really good place to get to go through initially. Uh, the BSI group is the former British standard, so if you need to be compliant with particular BSI recs, I think there's about five of them now currently for BIM alone. That's the resource site. I got some things from there, but most of them are paid guides, and HP didn't want to pay for me to get them, so I just perused. The National BIM Library actually is a very useful thing indeed. As part of familiarizing myself with Rev for doing some of this work, um, I wanted to be able to drop in objects. The National BIM Library is literally a giant collection of generic objects like um, ducting, doors, chairs, fixtures, fittings, structural elements from uh, both generic and from specific manufacturers. So to get started in using 3D objects and placing them in the building, it's great. It's free. There's no cost involved with it, it's just a really useful resource. It also includes some additional functionality so that you can say, this is a fire door, this matches this part of the spec, so we can do that thing earlier I was talking about. So in terms of actually implementing BIM in an organization, there's two levels. Um, a lot of the documents I've been reading going through recommend starting with level one. This is where we do BIM solely within the organization. 
Now, this allows an organization to, to get familiar with it without having to deal with other people's standards and other people's way of doing work. It's the simplest way forward and it's best suited to small projects. Level two BIM, which is the one we're all concerned with, is collaborative BIM. This is where there are prime contractors and where we need to work with the prime contractor to always update our, our guide, or we will be the prime contractor ourselves and we need to work with subcontractors that have been either selected by the customer or possibly by ourselves. Within that, the prime contractor will have to appoint a centralized BIM manager who will set standards and at a minimum a BIM coordinator who will coordinate to make sure that everyone's following the rules and isn't checking things out and not checking them back in. Everyone updates the model in, in collaborative BIM. Everyone has feed in, everyone can change it, which is why we need to have roles solely dedicated to managing the BIM model itself. Because without that, we'll wind up with the classic situation we have right now where you get on site, you have the plans, you just go, the plans do not match the circumstances on site, and then we need to bodge and fix. And then we gradually and gradually and gradually move away from what the plans are to what the building is. So two of the major roles, and um, there are often lots of subsidiary roles, but I just want to keep it high level here. BIM manager, person who sets the standards, person who sets, who defines what software you're using, person who defines what particular standards we're using, the process of workflow, how long you can check the plans out for, how that works, how checking them back in works, how make all the fine details of how that works at a high level. The BIM coordinator then is responsible for ensuring that that actually works in practice especially key for ensuring that the, the BIM model retains integrity, that we don't lose walls between checking things in, checking things out, that changes to accommodate ducting or pipes or whatever we need to change also still work with in terms of the specifications the project we're working for. Very key role. And in terms of what the impact on IT is, both the BIM manager and the coordinator need visibility of the full model. I'll be discussing in great detail how not everybody needs access to the full model, but these particular roles require access to the full model. They need to make sure that things haven't been broken by someone else, working at a different level of detail, working on minor parts that they don't somehow wind up breaking something else in the model. So these users, despite their role not being in some ways immediately creative in terms of actually designing things, these individuals are often the most key form of performance requirement. They will often wind up with the most highly spec machines on the floor to ensure that they can do their work as smoothly as possible because they do become, in some degrees, a bottleneck to the whole project if they're waiting 10, 20 minutes to add or manipulate things. BIM is driving a transition away from the traditional drafting tools. Uh, working with a lot of customers in Dublin, I've seen an awful lot of AutoCAD LT and similar drafting style applications, predominantly 2D focused, very straightforward, very lightweight, and particularly over the last 10, 15 years, it's meant that a wide range of computing platforms will give you the performance you need to work on these projects. Um, this isn't particularly, this isn't true in the BIM world. BIM is natively 3D. So the examples I'll be using here are predominantly Autodesk's products, Revit and AutoCAD. Um, we have a very close relationship with Hewlett Packard with Autodesk, so I can get access to demo licenses, so they're just the ones I'm most personally familiar with. There is a Revit LT product in the same way there is an AutoCAD LT product. But Revit LT is very much a minor subset of what Revit does. Revit will take in your mechanical, your electrical, your plumbing. It will bring in your structural elements. You can have all of those tied in. Revit LT strips all those out and produces Revit the drafting tool, which means that it's not suitable for most tasks. Perhaps if, you, if your particular aspect of the job just covers the areas that Revit LT does, it might work. But by and large, most organizations have moved to full-scale Revit for all of their users because just because someone today is just doing um, wall panels doesn't mean that on the next project we might not need them to do structural members. We can't define that as narrowly as we used to. And that means that we're having to look at refreshing significant amounts of equipment up to modern standards to support that. BIM being 3D means we have to be wary of what that means. We need 3D accelerators for the devices. We need performance for these devices. The re one of the major reasons why BIM is a 3D first application is because of the density of information we're displaying. We're not merely displaying the, the first floor, we're displaying the first floor and all the fittings. We're displaying the first floor and all the electrical fittings and all the plumbing. There's just too much information to work in a 2D fashion. We need to be able to separate these elements out and filter them out dynamically. But we don't need all the detail. So if I'm, for the sake of argument, I'm the roofing contractor, I don't need to be able to see the fine details of 
what the patterns are on the side of the columns of the building. I don't need any of that detail. What I need to know is where are the key structural elements of the building, where am I tying into, what are the, the specifications of the connectors I'm working with. So I don't need to go investing in the kind of equipment necessary to support it at a full level of detail, say like someone with an interior design functionality or a designer might need in the overall. So I can tailor the level of equipment I have to the specifications that I need. Now, depending on the project you're working on, there will be multiple levels of detail defined. I've seen multiple diagrams for, de for describing this, but I think the easiest one is probably the model that Revit uses, where you have a coarse level of detail, a medium level of detail, and a fine level of detail. The coarse level of detail is most commonly used for structural objects because you don't particularly care where the chairs are in the room, so there's no point in rendering those. Fine level of detail is more commonly used for higher level design tasks, laying out grounds, making sure that the whole project as a whole, for final renders, for example, are all done at the fine level so that we can produce video walkthroughs for customers to interact with. In terms of what this does to specifications for your company and your devices, the CPU is, is key here, but in reality, most of the work is going to be done by the GPU. The key thing for the CPU is that we need high clock speeds. Modern CPUs are evolving to having multiple cores. A core in the classic days was the CPU. Pentium 3s, Pentium 2s were all single core CPUs. The CPU was the core, core was the CPU. There was no change. Over the last 10 years, we've increasingly realized that an awful lot of what goes into the CPU is not the bit that does the maths. The bit that does the maths is oftentimes one eighth to one tenth of the total surface area of the chip. So it became practical to, instead of just keep making the whole chip bigger and bigger and bigger, we'll just put more of these maths cores onto one chip. So now, typically speaking, even low-end CPUs are dual core, so they have two whole CPUs, and most mainstream CPUs are quad core. We'll have four CPUs, essentially, on one physical package. Uh, this means that we have a tremendous amount of processing power per system these days. When I first entered the industry and you were doing architecture, you bought a big, essentially a server in a box because it was the only way to get two CPUs into one box. These days, even low-end notebooks will have two or three CPUs. Unlike a lot of areas of life where having more cores is simply allows you to go faster because you can do things, more things in parallel, 3D calculations are inherently what we call thread-bound. In other words, there's only one of them running. Because so much of the 3D calculation is, do I draw this? depends on, have I drawn this? There's no way to parallelize that. I need to do tests in a sequential fashion. So clock speed is the number one determinant for performance for CPUs. We've done extensive amounts of testing internally in HP with, the, with all of the latest benchmarking suites. And for 3D applications, it's all about clock speed. As such, the need to buy six, eight, 12 core CPUs such as are suitable for a server environment doesn't make sense for the 3D workstation. The 3D workstation ideally wants as few cores running as fast as possible. So the most common CPU we're currently selling is a six core 3.4, four gigahertz CPU for 3D tasks. The most common ta CPUs we sell for digital media tasks are 12 and 24 core tasks because those kind of tasks do benefit from lots of cores and not so much clock speed. Generally speaking, we're seeing the Xeon E3 range of CPUs be the most common choice for customers in this segment, um, or the low-end E5 range. There's very little cause to move to dual socket workstations for the majority of the customers I work with. By and large, those large dual socket machines are reserved for folks who are involved in very detailed engineering projects such as oil and gas, who are dealing with project file sizes that would run into the one and two gigabytes, so ship engineering. The other folks who do need those and who are working on standard buildings are people who are doing flow simulation, if you're working with water, if you're doing stress simulation on the device. Those tasks do actually parallelize quite well. So when I'm talking to a lot of customers, I will often say, look, if there's someone in this room who's doing um, stress analysis, failure analysis on the structure, we'll give them a different machine to everyone else on the floor. But everyone else on the floor who's designing the building doesn't need that we won't invest on that for them. So BIM is in a lot of ways forcing us to look at who our users are, what it is they're doing, and do what levels of performance they require to do their specific role. In terms of memory, it's a simple story. 16 gigabytes is the standard 
Um, I refer to it as a minimum here for these kind of tasks. And 32 gigabytes is often used for um, lar for more larger projects, projects where I am doing that failure analysis, flow analysis kind of kind of tasks. Generally speaking, you'd only need larger if your current project file sizes, uh, be it Revit or be it whatever application you're using, are m running much larger than about one and a half, two gigabytes. If you're into those kind of mega projects, then yes, you might need to look at 64 gigabytes. The rough rule of thumb that we've seen and that we've experienced in HP is that you need 20 times your project file size as RAM. The GPU or graphics card, um, the language for this is, has jumped around a fair bit over time. Um, you'll see referred to as discrete and integrated as well. Integrated graphics is the graphics that's in your typical notebook today. The CPU does the graphics tasks and it uses the system memory for storing all the images. These type of graphics were worked very, very well indeed for the likes of products like AutoCAD LT and the 2D drafting applications because fundamentally there wasn't a lot going on. In the 3D world, these are crippling to performance, particularly because they're using system memory to store data rather than having their own dedicated ultra high speed memory like the dedicated graphics cards have. We've, see, we've done a lot of testing internally and even low end cards costing 70 euros or less, professional low end cards will outperform integrated graphics by a factor of four or five. It's just, it's not even worth us raising it with a lot of customers. There has been some talk of, you know, better quality integrated graphics from a number of the manufacturers today. Our testing has shown that for the low cost of investment in a dedicated graphics card, you're still going to get multiples of the performance you can get without it. And for the cost of the investment, we would absolutely recommend it. Now, there are a wide range of professional class graphics cards, ranging in cost from the 70 euro mark all the way up to five and 6,000 euros per card. Generally speaking, most of the customers don't need to go all the way up there. Um, that kind of card is generally reserved for if you are doing very specific structural failure analysis. There are a number of very high-end applications like CATIA, et cetera, that will offer very detailed stress and component testing modules that can leverage those cards. But if, you're, if you require that, if you're using what's called CUDA, C-U-D-A, or OpenCL code, um, come talk to us. We're more than happy to share the details of performance we have today. But generally speaking, most folks will be in around the Quadro 1000, 2000 level and on the AMD Fire Pro side, about the W5100, W4000 range. Those are the cards that most customers are coming to us for today. We have seen a number of customers say to me, I could buy this professional card for eight, 900 euros or I could buy this consumer card for 300 euros. Why don't I just buy the consumer card? Well, the kind of things that AutoCAD and the kind of calls that AutoCAD makes on the graphics card are different from those that the consumer cards support. The consumer cards are designed from the ground up for video games. Video games use a very specific subset of graphics instructions to draw things on the screen. Video games are not concerned with wireframe. They're not concerned with anti-aliasing because by and large, that's not the kind of thing that user is doing. They use what's called full scene and anti-aliasing, which means the entire screen is blurred. That works fine for shooting aliens. It does not work fine for working with applications such as AutoCAD or Revit or ArchiCAD or CATIA because it also blurs all the controls on the screen at the same time. What we need are what's called wireframe anti-aliasing to stop the entire image breaking up into a, a riot of jagged edges and the whole building looks smooth, that's what the professional cards can do that the consumer cards can't. Fundamentally as well, because the professional cards support a different subset of instructions to the consumer cards, I have 70 euro consumer graphics uh, professional class graphic cards outperforming 400 euro uh, consumer class graphic cards because they just do different things, particularly the OpenGL applications. Storage has become a huge thing. Um, for years, there was nothing interesting in hard drives. They were just hard drives. They got bigger, and that was about all you could say for them. SSD has really changed all that. SSD has led to a huge sea change in how quickly and how flexible staff can be, particularly in engineering. It used to be that you'd open up your project, and you'd go off, make coffee, have a chat with James or Jane down the road, come back to your machine 20 minutes later and it might, it might be ready for you to touch it. With SSDs, we're cutting all that time out. Um, 
SSD models doing some of the playing I was doing with demo models that had been supplied to me both from Autodesk and from the team in Engineering Ireland, I was measuring time differences on the order of 400% between opening the model on a mechanical hard drive and opening it on an SSD. It just means that when I have strike that notion of, oh, I did something on that, on that project for, for Bob last year, I just want to quickly open that up, grab that, and pull it into my new project. On a mechanical disk, I might think, oh, but I've got to go got to load that up. That'll be 20 minutes. I'll just do it from scratch. Whereas with an SSD, I can fire that up in two minutes, and I can pull the thing out I need, close it down, and I've saved myself 15, 20 minutes work recreating the wheel. That's where SSD really adds its value. There's multiple types of SSD on the market. SATA drives are the most common ones available. Lowest cost models um, offer huge performance gains over rare mechanical drives. We've been recommending most customers to take at least one of these, even if it's a small one, 128 gig drive paired with maybe a one terabyte mechanical so that you can store all your projects on the device, but when you need to use them, you pull them into the SSD so you can manipulate them quickly. Um, for customers who demand the very highest levels of performance, particularly those customers who are dealing with very large data sets, they've been moving to the next generation PCIe SSDs, or otherwise known as NVMe SSDs. Now, we at HP have been supplying these from, from the word go because of our high-end customers who are demanding them from us. And we have the HP Z Turbo Drive is our, is our unique branding on these. And we have these available in size up to 512 gigabytes. And they can be up to twice as fast as other SSDs, depending on the access patterns and, and details like that. So we've seen a lot of customers take low-end PCIe SSDs as the, for their primary boot drive and for where the scratch drive in particular for Revit lives and then have a mechanical drive in the background, or instead of having it on the local device, they have all their long-term storage on a SAN on the network, and they just pull things down as they need it onto the device. We at HP have actually cooperated with both AEC Magazine and Case Incorporated consultants to produce a number of detailed guides on how you can optimize Revit, AutoCAD, etc., for the best performance on your workstation. Now, obviously, these are authored by HP in conjunction with these. There's an element advertorial. They're very H heavily HP branded. But all the tips and tricks will work whether you're a HP customer or not. Hopefully reading them will make you a HP customer, but they'll work anyway. Um, first one here is the Autodesk Building Practical Optimization Guide. This guide is less than three months old. It's right up to date with the latest 2016 versions. All the latest technology is in there. The two case guides are slightly older. How to control Revit file size and how small firms should prepare for the BIM 2016 mandate. They're slightly older. All the tips and tricks are still very valid, though. So for your existing fleet of machines today, I particularly recommend the how to control Revit file sizes and the Autodesk building design guide because they have a number of very useful tricks in there so that if you're just deployed Revit on your existing fleet of machines, you're finding the performance is very much compromised. These guides will get you a lot of performance back very easily. The other major impact of BIM has been on mobility. So over the last five to 10 years, five years especially, we've seen notebooks shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink. Until now, I have a 13 inch notebook that weighs less than a kilo. We're genuinely getting into some really quite impressively low weights for these devices. But a big part of how that's been achieved is by making the CPUs go slower. By going slower, they output less heat, which means we don't have to put in fans, means we don't have to put in big lumps of copper to cool the hot things. This mitigates against being good at doing 3D. 3D generates a lot of heat. Um, High-end 3D cards especially generate an incredible amount of heat. So for on-site performance, if you want a device that can, if, you're, if you're, your users are frequently outside of 4G coverage areas, if you can't guarantee a reliable high-quality connection back to your internal data center, you need that performance in a notebook. It means you're moving away from the ultralights. It means you're moving into the larger, heavier devices. I recommend quad cores minimum for desk-based workstations. I still recommend quad core for notebooks. Again, that's going to push you away from the lightweight 12, 13 inch, even 14 inch platforms in many cases, and to the 15 inch and larger platforms. There's a slight wrinkle in the Intel naming convention. On the desktop, an i3 is always a dual core, an i5 is a quad core, and an i7 is a quad core with a feature called hyperthreading, which allows it to pretend as if it's eight core. On the notebook, core i5, i3 and i7 are all dual core, unless it's a core i7 Q. So I have some examples here. The core i7 4710MQ or the core i7 6700HQ are quad core CPUs. 
The Core i7-6600U, though, is not. It is a dual-core CPU. If you look at uh, your properties under a Task Manager, it will look like a quad-core, but it's actually a dual-core CPU with hyper-threading. So, highly recommend, when you're looking at a machine, Core i7 does not necessarily mean quad-core on a mobile platform. Now, this is an example of some of the, the points I'm making. So, this is our new ZBook Studio 15-inch. This is a 15 inch with quad core. It weighs two kilos and it has a professional class Quadro 1000M graphics card in it. It's the lightest weight quad core platform on the market. When we need more performance from there, when we want the higher end graphics cards, we want the faster quad core CPUs, we then go up to the 15 G3. That's a two and a half kilo platform. And as we put higher end graphics cards into it, they get bigger heat sinks and the weight goes up a little bit more. Mm -hmm. When we get up to the 17-inch platform, which offers the very highest end performance, we can put dual disks into this, I can put very high-end CPUs, I can put in Quadro M5000 graphics cards. Um, if I need to do flow control, flow simulation on the move, if I need to do high-end video capture or audio engineering on the move, this is the kind of platform I'm working on. This unit weighs about three, three and a half kilos. Now with the current trends in mobility being to be, I want my mobile device to be as lightweight as possible, I like walking around with tablets, We've been increasingly pushing the power of remote access to your computing resources. Big advantage of being having all your data off-site is it doesn't matter what happens to the device you're accessing the data on. So my notebook gets lost, it gets run over, it gets a ton of concrete poured on it. It doesn't matter. I haven't lost anything. It's all back in the data center. Of course, we need to be able to rely on data connectivity back to the data center in order for this to be realized. But if we have that in place, remote access is hugely popular. Now, there's two ways of doing remote access. One is remote access to your workstation. In other words, you have a desk-based workstation, uh, a, the classic big old box. Um, still the most cost-effective way of getting performance is to buy a big old box. You buy the big old box and you remotely connect to it from your mobile device, be it a Windows tablet, Android tablet, whatever it is you're using, iOS tablet. The other option is a purely virtualized workstation, whereby you share a server with multiple other users and you all access the same resources it can deliver huge savings, particularly for regular desktop users. The challenge of virtualized workstations for the Revit user, for the high-end designer, is that high-end designers typically use all of the performance of their existing desktop. Virtualization has been such a huge gain for so many of my customers because when I give them a standard i3, i5 PC to their standard user who's using Microsoft Office, a good 70 to 80% of the potential of that machine is wasted. They're just not using it hard enough to actually use all that performance power. So I can take those users and I can allocate them onto a server. I can, for example, a typical installation we did recently was a 24 core server with 200 users on for Citrix. For standard Office users, just doing Microsoft Office. Ideal scenario for them, gave them the performance they needed for those users. By that count, I'm roughly eight to one, eight users to one core, because that was roughly how busy they are. Oftentimes when we're involved in virtualizing workstations, those numbers flip around. I'll have one user getting two physical cores. So I'm not getting cost savings in terms of physical capital asset equipment in virtualizing my workstation users, but I am getting the advantage of it's easy to roll out new users. I just create a new session as long as I have the physical capacity, of course. And all because I'm accessing network resources from a network device, all my access to my SAN, etc., happens super quick. Um, there are additional challenges about making 3D work in that scenario. There's some very specific graphics cards that you have to purchase and you have to design it in a very specific fashion. So the classic Citrix farm will not work for Revit. It has to be a VDI installation, a virtualized desktop, uh, which there are challenging projects, but when they're realized, they deliver huge value. Um, absolutely, contacts would be delighted to work with you on that. Remote access is probably the easier one to pull off in the short term. And it's certainly the one we see particularly smaller firms going for in much critical stuff. Um, HP has a remote access product as standard with all of our workstations called HP Remote Graphics Software. Um, it's a mature solution. We've had it for 10 plus years. The Mars rover images were sent back via HP RGS. So we know it's got high quality imagery <laughs> capabilities. It's scalable. You can decide. So if you're on a very narrow 3G connection, you will get a rough image, but you'll still be able to access your remotely. Then when you get back into the hotel, you get back off site with a proper wired connection, you can turn the quality all the way back up and it's just like you're using it at home. It's optimized for 3D. A lot, of the, a lot of the protocols are leveraged from old 2D protocols. 
and they're not designed to work with 3D natively. Because our software was designed from the ground up for 3D, we, we think it's a particularly good solution. Like I said, if you have a HP workstation today, you can download it, install it, and have a play around with it and use it. Um, absolutely get in contact with us if you need licensing. Uh, you're licensed as standard with a HP workstation to use this, and it's the most common path we're seeing for folks. With the HP Z440, I can load that up with a large amount of RAM, high performance CPUs, high quality graphics card, and then I can take a very lightweight device on the move with me, be it a tablet, be it a, a lightweight 12 inch notebook, be it a lightweight 12 inch Windows tablet. You have a great deal of flexibility. So you can then comfortably walk around the site, take all the notes you need, manipulate all the data you need without having to have the larger 15, 17 inch units, which aren't as comfortable to walk around with on the Alva. Hopefully that was useful. Um, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them now. And indeed, for any folks who are viewing the webinar, if you have any questions or any details, I'd be delighted to come out and address those with you. We additionally, in HP, we've, in conjunction with our partners in SWORD Data, we are running offers on all of the machines I've been showing you here today. Uh, we'll be happy to send around the details of those. All of them are quad-core systems. All of them are coming with professional class graphics. They're all designed very much for the 3D world. And we've put together some specialized pricing. But if you're interested in having a chat with me, if you want to have a discussion, I'm available. My role is to come out and talk to customers and advise them on these things. Please don't hesitate to get in touch. Thank you very much. Absolutely, Ed. How can I help? I have a question about awareness. Um, what is the level of awareness of BIM managers of the extent of the kind of performance improvements that they can have using the kind of an informed decision-making process when it comes to the equipment they're using? Well, in a lot of cases, we've seen that folk, BIM managers in particular who have just come into the BIM world, oftentimes they'll have come in the past from an environment where it is mostly drafting application based. And because most systems will run drafting style uh, applic drawing applications very, very well indeed, thinking about computer hardware hasn't been a thing they've had to do for seven or eight years. So a lot of times I'll be brought in to discuss with project management companies and say, hey, we've started this project. It, Initially, it was going fine as we put in the base drawings, but now that we're adding in more and more of these layers, we're adding in the map layer, we're adding in the structure, we're adding in the design elements, the machines are going slower and slower and slower. And so at that point, I, can, I, I come in and I discuss with them. Sometimes we can easily get past this simply by adding more RAM or changing out some of the graphic cards and their existing solutions. It's not necessary to rip out the entire farm all the time. Sometimes, depending on the age of the environment, we do have to do a radical re reassignment of the equipment involved. But one of the things I always say when I'm talking to customers is, I have all of these diagrams. I have all of these numbers and bar charts that tell me this is faster than that. But ultimately, it's your projects and your environment is unique to you. That's why we in HP strongly believe in providing demo equipment. So I'll come in, I'll have a conversation with the customer and say, look, it sounds like you need um, an i7. It sounds like you need a Xeon E3. It sounds like you need this graphics card, this amount of RAM. How about I send you in this solution? You run it with your application, you give it to one of your designers, they use it for a week and a half, and they can tell us whether that's the right kind of solution, whether it's the kind of performance you need. And equally, if the user comes back and says it's great, oh, but the cost profile's wrong, come back to us. There's ways we can rejig that so that you can get most of the same performance, perhaps at a, at a more cost competitive rate. But absolutely, what I'd say is let's have this as a conversation because one of the things that became quite clear to me when I was playing with Revit, I have no idea what I'm doing in Revit. So I can't advise project managers on precisely what it is they're going to need for their project until I'm talking to them, because there's no generalized solution for this. I hope that was a useful answer. Thank you. It seems that the, the consumer graphics accelerators are very, very different to the professional grade mm -hmm. ones. And uh, I think a lot of people won't know that, mm -hmm. may not be aware of that. Um, Rusty, do you ship um, like professional um, grade graphics cards within the, within the workstations, uh, mm -hmm. or do we have to define those, or how do we find out more about that and, and effectively know what we need and where to get them? That is a very good point, David. I mean, I've seen this happen increasingly over the last, I'd say probably six years. You know, a lot of customers come to me and say, hey, I talked to you know my friend, I talked to my kid came to me and told me, you know, I could get this Quizbank consumer card. I use the GTX 970 as an example here. Um, that does all these numbers is super fast but you want to sell me this professional class card for it seems to be multiples of the cost and i'm not seeing the benefit what i often say is it is down to what they're targeted at so the consumer class cards are targeted very specifically at direct x which is a 
language for defining 3D shapes. OpenGL is the other major language for defining 3D shapes. OpenGL is predominantly used by professional class applications. CATIAs, um, a bunch of the Autodesk products, Maya, tools like that are predominantly OpenGL based. The consumer class cards focus on DirectX and they focus on the subset of DirectX that allows them to draw alien-like shapes. So they're quite aggressive at culling detail, for example. They do things like that to try and speed performance. The professional cards are focused on professional applications, so they have a very different way of working. Another significant difference is that the consumer card is a one-off purchase by one user. As such, the focus is less on robustness than it is on time to market and cost. We've worked with a number of customers around who are using professional class cards quite intensively. And particularly in some of the areas we work in, there's been quite a major encroachment of consumer cards. But typically speaking, after one purchase of consumer cards, within about 24 months or so, we're selling professional class cards in again. Because the work cycle that professional users put their 3D cards to is very, very different to the work cycle gamers put their cell through to. I mean, we all have uh, kids who love playing video games, but we don't let them do it for eight hours a day. And we don't let them do it for, you know, for 16 hours overnight. Or, well, we try and stop them. That's me. <laughs> the professional card is going to be used for eight hours a day. And overnight, it could well be running a batch job. It could be doing a render job for a fly through for the customer so that you can show them what their project is going to be looking like. Because of that quality, reliability, and mostly performance in the applications they're actually using for these tasks, the professional cards just make much more sense. It's also the fact that you can call us when it breaks. We don't ship consumer class graphics cards in our workstations. Um, we have a number of customers who take them because that suits them, but we don't stand over the warranty for those. We don't feel they're the right kind of quality for this. Have you carried out any ben benchmark studies of where the Irish BIM user is compared to the UK counterpart or the US counterpart? The Irish BIM community is much younger, uh, much less mature than the work we've been doing in the UK. Um, I work, I actually cover Scotland um, as part of my role here in HP. So I've been doing some work over the last three or four years with a number of UK customers. And because that market knew it was going to become a mandate, particularly in public sector tendering for 2016, they've been very aggressive at pushing it out there. In working with a number of UK, a number of Irish customers, it tends to be only the larger contracting companies that are contracting or running projects in the UK right now that are more aware of the BIM environment. Um, the awareness, particularly for smaller subcontractors, is much lower in the Irish market. But that's a purely informal survey. We don't have a formalized data on that. We have seen some of the work that Engineer Ireland in particular has done that suggests that there is still a significant scope of, of work out there for the Irish industry to get on top of BIM. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>